Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Rotor Roll Football Show. It is Tuesday, August 20th, training camp and the preseason rage on, never to end, never to give us actual real data. <laughs> Denny, we have to parse through who played four or five snaps with the first team offense and you know, whether it has any meaning at all or maybe Tank Dell just had to go to the bathroom. And, and, we, you know, and we don't know. We have no idea what any of it means, but we're going to try to tell you what we think it means. That includes Jalen Warren missing multiple weeks, quote unquote, with the hamstring injury, what the panic level is there. Curtis Samuel battling turf toe and throwing already kind of chaotic Bills receiver core into further chaos. Christian Kirk, uh, who had been one of the guys where all the, the preseason bros are like, I don't know, man, he, he didn't play four snaps. Uh, it seems real bad, real, real bad. Um, he's also not practicing and might be out of two receiver sets. Uh, Denny, oh man, Denny added Justin Fields to the show sheet. Uh, oh my god, uh, that may have been producer Adam, but we can. We, I, I'm always up for talking about the the Steelers' uh, quarterback situation. Which, by the way, and I posted this the other day on the X platform, formerly known as Twitter. Uh, I feel like Mike Tomlin is destined to treat uh, this quarterback rotation like I treat my two putters. I have, I have two putters, Pat. I have a ping from like 1998, okay, yes. that my dad bought me, and I have an Odyssey mallet putter that I bought last summer. And what I do is, if I struggle at all with one of them, I immediately switch to the other one. That's how you win in golf. And if you right, and if you make if I make one six footer, I stick with that putter for a few rounds, and then I'll switch back later. That's how that's how Fields and uh, 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 Russell Wilson are going to be treated this year. That's how you win at golf. That's how you go ten and seven, and once again easily make the AFC playoffs somehow, despite being the worst team in the league. And I accused Denny of adding Fields. Denny accused producer Adam. Uh, I meant to write Caleb Williams and the Bears. Um, <laughs> we want to talk about if we're undervaluing. Wholesale, the Bears offense. Denny and I think we're not allowing for enough of the upside outcomes. But the Chicago Bears, Ross Goodhelm, Broncos backfield, Raiders backfield, DeAndre Hopkins' updated timeline, Tank Dell's aforementioned questionable usage, the Broncos wide receivers who seem to get bigger every single week, um, the Commanders and their number two receiver battle, Malik Neighbors, so on and so forth. There's so much stuff. We have no idea if we can even get to all of it. Denny, what we can get to – because we host a little show called Galaxy Brains. Yeah. And um, you see it out in the wild all the time in the NFL. Are we seeing the ultimate Galaxy Brain with the Atlanta Falcons and not even playing their number two quarterback, uh, rookie Michael Penix, who one would assume desperately needs reps? Uh, they're not even playing him in the preseason. What do you think is going on here? And is this the Galaxy Brain to end all Galaxy Brains? I mean, I guess it is. I, I um, posited the other day online that – you know, maybe Kirk Cousins, an older yeah. Kirk Cousins coming back from an Achilles injury is not wrong. ready. Wrong. Right. And so you told me immediately, you somehow know that I'm wrong. Everybody online knows that I'm wrong. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I guess you all just watch uh, training camp, Falcons training camp every day. We do. And I, I guess I needed to start doing that. But uh, um, that was my, my immediate thought was, oh, Cousins is done and they're embarrassed and they're not going to talk about it until, you know, like three days before week one and when they're going to be like, yeah, yeah, Cousins, he's not ready. So Michael's going to start. Uh, but apparently that's not it. And they're just holding him out for no reason. If you don't have a webcam of what is going on at Falcons practice, you're not honestly grinding <laughs> season <laughs> not training sure. camp hard enough. You're being you're being outworked. I'm being you outworked. Are. You're being outworked by me and everyone on X, the social media platform formerly known. As Twitter, Denny. I really do think it's just more galaxy braining from a front office that, like, every year, like, all right, we got another top eight pick. We're not going to examine how we keep getting top eight picks, <laughs> but here's what we're going to do we're going to use it on a skill player and then contrive ways not to use them. And that seems to just be, again, uh, what you're doing with Michael. Pence. I mean, maybe it was hurting Cousins' feelings, the fact that Penix was good in the preseason. Um, maybe one thousand percent was. Yeah, and uh, and and maybe you know because with these, with these older sort of diva esque quarterbacks, you want to be careful about their ego, right? Like the Jets can't have a quarterback who's better than Aaron Rodgers, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, the Falcons can't have Michael Penix being better than Cousins. So Penix comes out, looks better than Cousins, and they say, no, 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 Ooh, we're reeling that back in. <laughs> we're, we're we're playing the worst guy. Uh, right now, uh, this is this is what we signed up for. So I, I do think that that probably plays into it a little bit. Do you do you think Michael Penix is already better than Kirk Cousins or no? 
I I was a believer in Penix coming out. I, I'm I'm completely ignoring the fact that he played 15 years in college. Um, <laughs> I, I I don't think that matters anymore. Uh, I I've been gonna say I've been working on a take where I I genuinely wonder. I was going back through some old stuff. I was talking about Sam Darnold on ADP chasing yesterday. And someone was like, you know, he was such a good prospect. He was so young. Mm. And I, we didn't get to debate on the heads. Like, you know what? Is that even good anymore? Because a lot of the the good kind of instant yes. franchise quarterbacks have actually been starting for multiple years at this point, And that maybe projectable upside isn't what we want in quarterbacks anymore. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I think that it's an outdated way to view the quarterback position. Um, I think in, a, in an era where experience matters and the ability to read and manipulate defenses matter probably more than physical ability, honestly, um, in, in the in the modern too high safety NFL. I think Michael Penix, not particularly gifted as an athlete. No, guy, guy doesn't really move much. But, but you know, accurate, uh, has a howitzer of an arm. I think that he can fit. I think that's why I, that's why I was like, yeah, Bonex is going to be good. Like, I'm sorry, but like, I don't care where he goes. He's going to be good. And uh, he ended up being in a really good spot with Sean Payton. So I, I, I would say, honestly, from a fantasy standpoint, Penix, there, there's no drop off. I don't think from Penix to Cousins, Cousins to Penix. It's all the same. To be clear, I want Penix to make starts this year. Uh, really, really want Penix to make starts. And uh, I want Kirk Cousins trade. I want chaos. I want Kirk Cousins traded to the Giants week five. Um, honestly, the, the the most hilarious Kirk Cousins outcome is getting traded to the Browns. Um, that's oh. what I really, really <laughs> want is Kirk Cousins traded to the Browns. They're, they're going to have $1 billion they worth will. of quarterback contracts. They will. They will. They will. The, listen, they said it. You, you say it can't be done. They say, watch me. Right. They say, well, here's some math. You they know, say, we're here's gonna, some we're math. Just do the math. We're going to crunch the numbers. Then here's some math. Multiple weeks is more than one week, and multiple <laughs> weeks is what Jalen Warren is currently expected to miss with his hamstring injury. Uh, he's in doubt for week one. Doubt is strong. When I say in doubt, I mean that by the spirit of the phrase where we just don't know if he's going to be ready for week one. He's not doubtful. He is in doubt. <laughs> Jalen Warren, someone who honestly I expected to get steamed all summer and just isn't at all. He's hanging around the RB2-3 borderline. Mm -hmm. Is that risky? What's the deal with Jalen Warren? Are we worried? Like, is this like a if Najee Harris goes nuts in week one? Like, is it over? Uh, just what is our concern level with Jalen Warren and his hamstring injury? I do want to just say that you, you sounded awful, and I'm not getting political, but you, all, you sounded awful Clintonian there with the parsing <laughs> of the words, the definition. What is the definition of is? I don't know That's what the what definition of is is, and I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. say, he's not doubtful. He's doubtful-esque. <laughs> uh, no, I, you know, look, uh, I'm I'm taking Jalen Warren in redraft only if he slips well, well, well past ADP. You know, if the if if the league you're drafting in is panicking over the news, which I, I think is is reasonable, honestly. I mean, it, it's not your your average hamstring injury. It's not like Jameer Gibbs hamstring injury seems much less serious than this Warren thing. Um so if he's dropping a, a round or even two rounds past ADP, then I'm looking at him and saying, ah, maybe I can take him, just stash him, see if he gets better, see if he comes back at full health, uh, takes on the role that I think he was going to have in the first place. Uh, with with Najee Harris, um, I think if you're drafting like zero RB-ish type, type stuff and you're looking for running backs in the middle rounds, I think you gotta you got to think hard about Harris. You never have to think hard about Harris. I'll well, yeah, you, but you, but you were you were hurt last year by Najee Harris. I well, it was the one time I ever drafted him, and yeah. it was solely because he had fallen, and I had right. to think hard about him in the middle rounds. And surely, even Najee Harris is a value at this ADP. And let me tell you, Najee Harris is never a value at any ADP. I mean, it's a boring, it's a boring pick, and I, I think you know it's. It's contingent on him scoring a lot of touchdowns, probably, you know, a good amount of touchdowns anyway. Um, but I, I do think that folks who drafted Harris in the in the past month or so, I think it's going to pay off, at least in the short term. A lot of thinking hard about Harris, Vinny. Um, well, next up. Oh, no. I, what I will say real quick on Jalen Warren is uh, it's the exact wrong time of summer to suffer a hamstring injury. Yeah, because. 
now you're in a race against time for week one and you're in the zone where the team might rush you and like, let's get him out there. Like, I know maybe he shouldn't actually be practicing today, like Wednesday of week one, just to see what he's got. You know, he's been feeling good for two days. Ideally you want to be feeling good for like a week. Like he felt good right. yesterday. So right. let's have Jalen practice today. And then he makes it through practice and five minutes in the right. first quarter, he's re-injured the hamstring. That, that would be the worry is that he's rushed back because um, they see him as a key part of this offense. You know, I mean, this offense doesn't have much going for it, right? It has pickings and it has the, the running backs and that's it. OK, like Pat Fryermuth, he's like he's a rotational tight end in the preseason. I don't know if that's going to carry over. I wouldn't be surprised if it does. It makes him completely fantasy irrelevant. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if they rush Jalen Warren back. Steelers very, very low. And my ranking the offenses article that I am desperately trying to get out this week. Keep working on it. Looking very powerfully into getting that finished. Looking very strongly at this Bills receiver core yet again. Denny, but this time it's because of injury. Curtis Samuel is turf toe, turf toe, an infamous week to week injury. I get the feeling he'll probably be healthy for week one or ready for week one. Turf toe is like the ultimate like setback, re injury, injury. Uh, does this change how you're approaching the Bills' backfield where there is no like one size fits all approach to the, excuse me, the Bills' receiver core? Like everyone's kind of taking like, I'm a Samuel guy. Uh, I've been a Shakir guy, uh, you know, since before this dynasty league even started. Like I've always been a Keon Coleman guy going back to his freshman year in college. <laughs> yeah. Does the turf toe issue for Curtis Samuel change the already uh, confused calculus for this Bills receiver group? I want to apologize real quick if folks can hear my dog Ziggy barking in the background. Uh, he's uh, losing his mind. Uh, he's anyway, yeah, Ke- yes, uh, Keon Coleman playing, uh, running 100% of the routes with the first team offense in the preseason. Seems like he's locked in. Uh, you know, so I, I do think it's reasonable to take him first among these receivers, but I think the value play, the way I'm playing it is Shakir. Um, Shakir's just super efficient. Um, you know, I, I saw a, a study done the other day. It showed like adjusted yards per route run, depending on how many receivers are on the field. And long story short, Shakir really popped and he pops everywhere. Every time I look into Shakir, he pops here and there and there, and and I think that he can do a lot with a little. The Curtis Samuel toe thing, I think, is significant for Khalil Sh- Shakir because it looked like, at least in the first preseason game, like Curtis Samuel and Shakir were going to rotate in the slot position. Okay, that was terrible. I was truly sad about that. Uh, the bank examiner called me several times that week. Uh, he didn't call after the Curtis Samuel in- injury, and I, and I think that's why. So I, I really, telling. I do very, very telling. I do think uh, Sh- Shakir makes a lot of sense. I think Shakir is like a great pick, especially if you have to fill like multiple flex spots in a half PPR or a PPR league. He's a great guy to just get and just plug in. And I think that he could be surprisingly productive in this Bills offense. I, yeah, I think the approach all along in the Bills receiver core is just kind of been like, what's who's the default option here? If we're trying to make predictions about an unsettled like position group, like who requires the fewest dots to connect? And Shakir is the guy who has already been there, who played a lot last year, played way more snaps than anyone realized. So they don't have to work him in. Like there's no, like maybe they'll expand his role or he'll be doing some different things this year. Like his baseline, not that Curtis Samuel, like doesn't know what he's doing, but the, Shakir's baseline was already, like what he did in this offense was already so high uh, yeah, there's just the fewest leaps in yeah. logic to Shakir snaps and hopefully Shakir targets. Uh, it would be nice. We still don't really entirely know if he's good. Um, I'll say it with Shakir. Uh, I think he might. I think he might actually be good. He's a dog. I know that that that's for sure. He has dog levels. Um, I will just caution folks. I, I I know Bills fans got really mad when I pointed this out with statistical evidence. Uh, but Joe Brady likes to lean on the run, especially with the lead. So uh, I don't expect this offense to produce a ton of pass volume that could be an issue for a guy like Shakir. Uh, Keon Coleman, by the way, ran one bad route. Is it over? Um, there was a <laughs> gift of him uh, getting owned or something at the line of screen. I can't remember what it was. Uh, is it uh, over? Yeah, uh, no. Keon Coleman is fine because um, he's a, a, a jubilant guy and people like him online. And he's got yeah. Listen, the real reason is he's got a, something of a breakfast narrative with Josh Allen. Yeah, they're not eating breakfast every day, but Josh Allen was pounding the table for uh, Keon Coleman. And something. I did, I did read in a recent report that Allen looks to nobody else in the red zone uh, besides Coleman. And so 
Coleman could be a guy who just gets away with it with touchdown production. And so, you know, fantasy managers who take him could get away with it. Keon Coleman, seven touchdowns. Dawson Knox, six touchdowns. Dalton Kincaid, three touchdowns. And it's never that sounds more. right. I will say. Never, ever, ever been more over. Has it been more over for Christian Kirk? Denny, the, people are freaking out that he wasn't in two receiver sets and very limited Jags preseason action. Yeah. Now he's banged up, missing time with the calf injury. Davis Maddock reminded the other day on ship chasing, which I went on. Um, I don't know if you heard of You it. mentioned yeah, I didn't. Actually, it was ADP chasing, not ship chasing. No. Um, but th this is not the first time we've had this preseason Christian Kirk freak out. In fact, the exact same thing yes. happened last year. But you know, entirely new supporting cast this year, though. Hopefully, like a new offensive approach, just a more coherent approach to the wide receiver usage and wide receiver targets. Are we concerned about Christian Kirk, at least his usage, or is it just more like if you're going to worry about anything with Christian Kirk, worry about the injury? Like the targets and the slot reps are going to be there. Where are you at right now with Christian Kirk? A guy we don't like to talk about because he's kind of boring, but you have to talk about him because he's always in the wide receiver three mix. Uh, the slot stuff is is concerning because we mentioned uh, on the show last week that the Jags ran uh, used three receivers at the at the tenth lowest rate last year. Uh, so if that's the only way he's getting onto the field, then that's a problem for Christian Kirk. Uh, last year he got bailed out by some early wide receiver injuries for Jacksonville and they were forced to play him, even though they truly desperately did not want to. Um, he was good. He's strong. I mean, I mean, obviously they didn't want, they, they, they the only way is Zay Jones went down. Remember Zay Jones went down week one, somebody else went down and they were like, okay, fine. We'll play Christian Kirk. You think they didn't want to play their seventeen million dollar receiver? Well, then why why are they putting him in the slot? Why are they setting him up for basically? Well, he's not like, good on the outside, is why. Yeah, <laughs> that, it was like a fifty percent route rate. That's what we're looking at for Christian yeah. Kirk. Um, well, when you put it that way, I, I yeah, I mean, I'm 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 not drafting him anywhere near ADP. I don't really know how to play this Jags. I don't receiver either. core because. You know, Brian Thomas is going to be a boom bust guy. I mean, there's just no way around that. Gabe he's Davis, booming. I will say he's been booming. He, in Jaguars. He's booming. And, he, and, you know, he's probably going to be good uh, in the long run. And, and I, I would say that he's really good potentially for Trevor Lawrence because he's finally and, and Gabe Davis. They, they, they finally have guys who if they're going to insist on keep continuing to, for Trevor Lawrence to throw to the sideline downfield, then those two guys can get it done. Um, but I don't want either of them, and I don't want Kirk now. So, yeah, you, they finally have receivers who can make stretch Armstrong type catches on these just yeah. misplaced Trevor Lawrence balls. He doesn't throw the worst ball in the NFL, no, but he does not throw even anywhere close to the <laughs> best ball in no, the NFL, not, uh, not even close. And you need big perimeter targets. They also are claiming that Gabe Davis like might play all over the field, like they might use him like in a variety of ways, which oh man, it's, it's not so my money. So, something to monitor. I mean, look, I'm not I'm not opposed to Gabe Davis if that's if his usage is going to completely change from from how it was in Buffalo. The fantasy mind could not comprehend Gabe Davis never being good with Josh Allen and then somehow immediately getting unlocked by Trevor Lawrence. There, the fantasy mind would be an utter shambles. <laughs> You're right, um, myself right. very much included. People would uh, quit the game and enter the priesthood immediately. They would. They would. Um, Christian Kirk. He's a wide receiver 32 right now. He was the classic guy. I wasn't drafting him to begin with. And he's like, you didn't need to give me another reason not to draft Christian Kirk. And yet you did anyway. So you, uh, you, you've yeah. never been a Kirk guy. I have Kirk on a lot of teams uh, from, you know, the spring and early summer best ball stuff. And I felt good about it. I mean, I, I just, I was like, Oh, I have the Jags wide receiver one because Ridley's gone. But apparently that I do not. I felt better about it this year, too, because I thought it was just like, all right, they've got the two outside guys. Christian Kirk can finally just dominate in the slot where he should be because Christian Kirk has always been like an identity crisis player. The Cardinals could never figure out, like, is he a perimeter guy or is he a middle of the field guy? The Jags were having the same issue. I'm like, finally, they'll just use him the way that makes sense. And I guess that they are, but that they're just not going to use him that way enough in theory. If and then there's Evan Ingram, who runs yes. a lot of slot routes. I, I don't. I, I don't really know where Kirk fits in. It's just, it's, it's hard, hard to see. He was bailed. Just remember though, Davis was right when he said there was a panic last year around Kirk. 
it was a well-deserved panic and it worked out because of injuries. Not so you're right that, that we never really, we don't know how that would have turned out if Zay Jones had not gotten injured. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, it didn't look, it wasn't trending toward the team saying, no, 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 we'll just get Kirk in. We'll just have him run 90% of the routes. That was not the way it was trending. So Denny, not Justin Fields. We were talking about Caleb Williams who showed off some really cool stuff over the weekend you know, made uh, an amazing throw or two, which I think some people were saying oh, it wasn't actually amazing. Like uh, the throw, they weren't truthing the throws. They were truthing the performance of what I see is six of 13 for 70 yards. Yeah, so, yeah. Two cool throws, but they're looking like they're having fun. They're looking like there's going to be big plays, you know, entirely different attitude, entirely different feel to the Bears offense. And you and I have been wondering, like, so a lot, we've, Debated a lot in recent years. I think in the affirmative, too, is the conclusion that we've come to. The attempts are more, way more of a quarterback stat than we would like to believe. Caleb Williams was the ultimate attempts are a quarterback stat at USC guy. Uh, they, they very aggressively upgrade the entire supporting cast, not just the receiver core, but in the backfield, at least an upgrade in their minds um, with DeAndre Swift. And we just Are we wholesale undervaluing this Bears offense? Caleb Williams, you know, he's – He's generally in the top 12, but he's not always in the top 12. Like the people are, you seem like they're coming up more with reasons not to draft Bears receivers than to draft them. Like Keenan Allen, Roma Dunze are barely in the top 36. Uh, DJ Moore, you know, who was like a top eight guy last year, is not even always, he's not in the top 20 a lot of the times. And so are we wholesale undervaluing what could be just like an epically pass heavy and productive offense? I think so. Um, I mean, I think we can take advantage of the fact that Caleb Williams numbers have not actually been sparkling in the preseason and that the first team offense for Chicago is not pouring on touchdowns. Okay. If they had scored two or three touchdowns and Caleb Williams, like five uh, drives in the preseason, then we would see all of these guys spike in ADP, including Caleb Williams. I think we should kind of be grateful that that hasn't happened. Um, because look, uh, I'm not a not a film grinder, uh, but I see what I see, and I'm not seeing many quarterbacks operate the way that Caleb Williams no. is operating. And in fact, there's one who operates. Uh, there is the one guy. There's one say. guy who does. Um, and uh, okay, and this this argument that like, yeah, okay, well, like he made a, an a unbelievable throw, but we have to remember it was against plumbers. Um, it wasn't against the 2000 Ravens defense. Why, why won't Caleb Williams go against the 2000 Ravens defense? Why won't it? You know, why he's, won't? he's a coward. He won't do it. Yeah, um, okay. and, uh, to that, I say, come on, man, just, just see, let, like, watch, just enjoy it. And just like, watch. like, wow, that's actually special. The first overall pick is actually good for once. Um, you know, he's j- just, wow. what, I mean, they, <laughs> we finally got one. Um, the 10 for 20 for 170 yards, uh, so far in two preseason games, uh, a dot of 9.9, which is, which is pretty deep. Um, but I, I think it's just the, the, the creativity, the refusal to go down the ability to make plays out of pocket. Like that's the stuff that makes fantasy tick, right? Uh, that's the stuff that we've always complained about. Like, Oh, like Tua doesn't do any of that, you no. know, like, um, it, well, it is the stuff being coached out of the game. And he's it just is. like Patrick it Mahomes. Is. He's just too talented, so they don't coach it out of him. All right, and he and he does seem to have that sixth sense, um, that awareness he does. Uh, that Mahomes has, where Mahomes knows where all twenty-one other players are on the field at all times. And I mean, there are there are quarterbacks who don't even know where they are on the yes. field at, the, at any given yes. time. Yes. Um, so it's, so I, I, I think you, you need to, you probably need to just see it instead of be like 10 for 20, uh, 50% completion rate. I don't want that. This, this team's going to stink. No, they're, they're going to be good. They're going to score points. And I think look with Keenan Allen being large and old, um, I'm taking Roma Dunze over Keenan Allen at this point. I've adjusted that. I, there's just I just can't justify it anymore. I can't justify taking Allen. I'm not I'm not going to pretend that Allen's suddenly going to be better. Uh, so I'm taking a Dunze, uh, probably ahead of ADP. I'm taking DJ Moore at ADP, uh, and Caleb Williams looks like, along with Jaden Daniels, the key to late round quarterback this year. I've flipped to Dunze and Keenan Allen as well because like, why would you not at this point? Like yes. the guy who's had so many lower body injuries, like I don't 
now he's running around with 20 pounds more weight. Like he might lose some of that. It's like, yeah, I don't maybe Keenan Allen's hamstrings did not need any more like tension on top of them. Mm-hmm. And Roman Dunes, a top 10 pick. Like again, I, I worry about the JS, the JSNization of Roma Dunze and they're like, okay, he's an amazing rookie receiver, but he's in an offense with two of the most established vets in the entire league. Like where are the targets going to come from? And I just come from myself with the fact there's a big difference between being the number nine overall pick and the number 22 overall pick. Yeah. Keenan is, was he even going to be out there and yeah, two receiver sets and like, what yeah. kind of, and like, was this Keenan, a guy who's 32, I believe was that heel injury he suffered at the end of last year. That's finally the one who put him over the top. And like, like the injury that he just doesn't quite come. Not that it was like some huge debilitating injury, but Keenan Allen was a guy who really couldn't lose much more explosiveness. Yes. And he suffered yet another injury. And he's not in an offense. Yeah, it's all about him. Keenan Allen, like epic numbers. But like he should have never had those numbers. Like the Chargers offensive pr- approach was so bad for so many years. Yes. It's like the ultimate empty compiling, empty calorie stats. I think that's it. That's right. I've always thought the Keenan Allen's production with the Chargers was an indictment on the Chargers. It was. Um, you had to have, you had to make the plane out of something more than five yard Keenan Allen out routes where he does nothing with them. I mean, come on like that. Like it's just, it's just empty stuff. That's a bit mean. But- Is it too much? That's too much. It was too much, so it's a good time to take a break. Uh, We'll be right back after this. This Thursday, we are hosting our annual Roto World Draft Marathon, including the unveiling of Matthew Berry's Ride or Die Fantasy Football Happy Hour Player. That's right, 10 hours of nonstop draft prep beginning at 11 a.m. Eastern on Thursday, August 22nd. Check out NBCSports.com slash draft marathon for the full schedule. Denny and I will be doing a QA. and a as part of that marathon, Denny and I will be doing many, many, many mock drafts as part of that. Some are, some are yeah. arguing a world historic amount of mock drafts. <laughs> uh, we're doing a road world football show with Kyle Dvorak and special guest Andy Barons. Denny is doing a live Q&A as the lead in to our, our big PPR star studded mock draft at 8 p.m. Mm-hmm. Eastern. So it's just an entire day of really, really amazing stuff. And we, we've got a lot of great content coming at you. With a lot of great people, a lot of help from our friends. Thank you very much to everyone who's going to be appearing. Uh, I I will I will say, Pat. You know, I don't think I told you this off air, but uh, uh, August twenty second uh, happens to be my wedding anniversary, so mm. uh, I'm uh, I'm down pretty bad in that regard. Didn't, you know, uh, August sixteenth was my birthday, and you didn't wish me happy birthday until later in the day. You did wish me. Happy <laughs> I did. You actually very easily wished me happy birthday. <laughs> I wish you happy birthday at like 4 p.m. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you very, very easily wished me. Happy. Sorry, sorry, it wasn't at 4 a.m. I should have yeah, woken up. I, I took it personally. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know it was your anniversary. Yeah, uh, you need you someone know. else to do that Q and A. Um, well, hey, no, it's uh, it's fine. Actually, my wife's going to join me for the Q and A. No, I'm right, there you, she's going to join you. She's going to serve you during the Q&A. No, um, no, she's definitely not uh, doing that. To, no, I meant serve you with divorce papers. So, so, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, I thought you meant like dinner. No, yeah, no, 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 no. I meant the divorce papers. Oh, that makes more sense. So way, way more sense. And uh, so I didn't mean to embarrass you in front of all your friends, except I did. Um, <laughs> Come on. Oh, this got way too dark. You know what's very dark? Yeah. Is Gardner Minshew easily winning a quarterback competition in the year 2024? Kind of knew this was going to happen. Like a- Aiden O'Connell, like a little plucky upstart, nice narrative, but yeah, whatever. This Come on. It wasn't going to happen. No. I mean, no, it wasn't going to happen. Please. <laughs> I'm stealing your book. Please come on. Like See, that just, it, it just it just never made any sense to no, me. It didn't make any sense. It still does not make sense. Gardner Minshew is the starter. Do we care? Does it change anything? Was this already priced in? Uh, what about this Rangers offense, Gardner Minshew? I think it actually does matter quite a bit. I think Aiden O'Connell is borderline apocalyptic for this Vegas offense. Uh, um, curious. They scored 63 points of them at quarterback last year. And you don't <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. And you're right. One of the greatest <laughs> quarterback performances of all time where he handed it off for three quarters. I think he had like 20 yards. So yeah. yeah. Uh, Gardner Minshew. 35 dropbacks to 30 dropbacks for Aiden O'Connell of the first two preseason games for the Raiders. There's just stark differences everywhere. Uh, uh, Minshew's A dot was near 10. Aiden O'Connell's was six and a half. So we're talking about just check down after check down for O'Connell. Minshew actually was aggressive. Uh, Minshew had a much higher rate of downfield throws. 
uh, six and a half yards per attempt to 5.9 for O'Connell. So, you know, look, I Minshew is not great, but I think he's significantly better than O'Connell. And I, I, I think that Minshew's ability and willingness to go downfield is good for a lot. Most of the receivers here, most specifically Trey Tucker. I think Trey Tucker is absolutely dead in the water for fantasy purposes with O'Connell. I think with Minshew, he's interesting. With Minshew, all it really does is give us some sort of certainty about an offense where it was going to be nothing but uncertainty with Aiden O'Connell. Or Gardner Minshew, we saw with the Jags. We very much saw with the Colts. He understands as a backup quarterback what not to do. What not to do, which he does – his bad games, he does commit a lot of turnovers. In general, he takes care of the ball. And what to do, pepper your best players with targets. Uh, he did it all year with Michael Pittman last year. He's going to do it all year with Devontae Adams in Vegas. I just think we can at least expect Devont- or Gardner Minshew to lock on to Devontae Adams. With Aiden O'Connell, it's been like, I don't know what this guy is all about. I don't even know what he's going to do. Like, he might just say, uh, implode. Gardner Minshew will implode from time to time. Yeah. But he's going to get the ball to Devontae Adams. So it's just good to have at least certainty there. Devontae Adams will be getting the ball. And 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 Minshew's aggressive, like I said, and that that makes a big difference. He he can also create, you know, by, on his own to an extent. Um, whereas Aiden O'Connell, man, he's a Brissett style uh, creator, as in no creation, just you drop back and you throw it to your first read, and if your first seed is not open, you throw it out of bounds. Well, you drop back and just kind of wait for something to happen, which has been getting Jaco- Jacoby Brissett, a uh, very patient fella. Very, yeah, very uh, that, actually, that's called the full Garoppolo. <laughs> when you, when you drop, no, no, Garoppolo, though, is scared of getting hit. Brissett's like, listen, man, I'm waiting for someone to get open. Oh, yeah, and, 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 and like, if they don't get open, guess yeah. what I'm doing next? I'm getting hit. You're right, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I'm getting hit, guess what happens after that? I'm getting hurt. Yeah, I'm getting whacked by this <laughs> linebacker coming. Yeah. No, yeah, you're right. Garoppolo's, I forgot what it was like to watch Jimmy G. Garoppolo's main goal in dropping back was just not to get hit. Yeah, yeah. It didn't not matter what happened. The first guy's out. covered. Yeah, he's like, all right, whatever. I'm living to fight another day. Yeah. Jacoby Brissett's like, I'm a very large man. I'm sure I can absorb yet another. And I'm hurt. <laughs> That's what Anthony Richardson <laughs> thought too. I know. Uh, the, these guys, I feel like they overestimate the hits they can take sometimes. Please do not do that, Jacoby Brissett. Um, please do not draft Broncos and ancillary running backs, Denny, question mark, because it looks like Maybe the most likely outcome all along is going to be the outcome we get. Javante Williams, Julian McLaughlin, they were the only backs to see snaps of the first-team offense. Samaji P. Ryan has seen time of the first-team offense. This year, though, Audrey Estime was added to the mix. Blake Watson, people tried to be brave and give a little hype early in the offseason. But is this, this going to be basically the exact same Broncos backfield we saw last year? Or with Javante Williams as the core guy, Samaji Pirine is the primary third down back. And then Julian McLaughlin kind of just changes the pace as needed. Are we basically not seeing any deviation from that usage? What do you think is going on with the Broncos backfield? Yeah. um, It looks like, you know, McLaughlin is running more routes than Javante Williams. Williams did catch a a pass on the design screen from Bo Nix this past week against the Packers. I thought that that is for 15 yards. I thought that that was a a positive development. It, 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 possibly suggest it suggested that Javante's not just going to be an early down banger that he will be involved in the pass passing game because this is a Sean Payton offense that really loves to to design screens and dump it off to playmakers uh I will say Javante looks more explosive I, I have all sorts of film takes now Pat. I mean I've been watching so much film it's gonna be your downfall actually watching football is gonna be your downfall. I know I yeah I'm, I'm gonna blame you for some reason uh yeah, I mean, Javante Williams, uh, seven carries for 32 yards in the preseason. That's uh, 4.7 yards per carry. His yards per contact is is actually really good. Uh, uh, just to give you some context, 24 of his 32 rushing yards this preseason have come after first contact. So that that was not happening last year. That's that's the sort of thing that really he was he was struggling in those advanced metrics. Uh, so I, I, I like Javante. I've said this multiple times on the show. I like Javante where he's going. I think that he's an important part of a zero RB ish build. However you do that. Uh, McLaughlin is going later. He also works, but I only think he works in PPR. I really, I really just don't have much interest beyond that PPR scammy 
type role that he's going to have. There, there could still be some uncertainty in this battle. Like Samaji Piran could get cut. Yeah. A very, very, very outside chance. Javante Williams gets traded, but for a lot of reasons you just laid out, that that doesn't seem like that was like off season rumor that was not fueled by the Broncos. It just seems like it's not going to happen. Like Javante Williams just seems like he's going to be a Denver Broncos. Yeah, well, they, it was fueled because they took Audric Estime in the draft, and they said, well, why would they do that? Maybe they're trying to get rid of Javante. Sean Payton has had a lot of great things to say about Javante. Yes. Um, I'm not too, you look, I mean, the fact that Julio McLaughlin's still involved, like that's not a shock. What? He was just going to sit on the bench. Like that guy's a dog and Peyton mm-hmm. loves him. He's going to be involved. Andre Gustame is a dog too, though. I, I still wonder if we're at the end of the story here, but you basically, yeah, you just late. We're getting what we what made the most sense all along, which uh, a lot of sound and fury signifying nothing. Didn't you? <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, I will say McLaughlin doesn't profile as a guy. And it sounds this sounds funny almost, but he doesn't profile as a guy who's going to benefit if Javante Williams misses time. I think I don't think that he automatically gets more run. I think that he has the, the role that he has an Estime or whoever else, Blake Watson, I don't even know who else comes in and does and does the dirty work on first and second down. What you're saying is Jaleel McLaughlin is a cop, a change of pace back, didn't he? That's, he's just okay. a cop. He's just yeah, a he's a, cop. he's a cop and he's gonna see moff targets, you know. <laughs> So these are facts. These are facts. It's also facts that it's totally over for Zamir White, apparently. Uh, he played in the second half of a preseason game. It is not good. I think there are some extenuating circumstances, but talk about a player who did not need to give people another reason to doubt him and like his, his 2024 potential output. What's the story with Zamir White? How uh, strong is the concern? I mean, this should not shock anybody. Like he was never going to be a three down back. He was never going to have much involvement in the past game unless they just had like a string of backfield injuries in Vegas. Uh, So this is what you get. Like he's going to be a a touchdown dependent game script, sensitive early down running back. Like we know this prototype. We have seen it many, many times. That's what you're getting when you draft some your weight. There is no other avenue for him in fantasy uh are the raiders going to be good enough to you know support that sort of you know early down banger i don't know i don't think so maybe maybe if the maybe. defense is good enough maybe. the defense could be good but here's the thing that what if the raiders offense is so dysfunctional and it, and it could be okay they could rotate quarterbacks Minshew's not really that good what if it's so dysfunctional on the offensive side that it puts the defense into these horrible situations we've seen this we've seen good defenses being put into untenable situations where they just have to give up points like it's just the way it goes like you get like Minshew throws a pick uh and uh, at on his own three yard line well the defense is not stopping that you know so anyway I I I worry about why I'm not targeting him really at all uh, even if he drops in in ADP yeah I think he he had one of two outcomes to me either Freebie RB2 or like instant this year is Alexander Madison, which is, you know, of course, a bit interesting since Alexander Madison is his backup. But like Alexander Madison last year was the guy we, we were never totally sold on him as an RB2, but the role was there on paper. He was going to like the seventh, eighth round right on that borderline. And then, yeah, it just he wasn't good. And the offense wasn't good enough uh, somehow, even though they had Kirk Cousins for half the season. Um, and it just didn't happen. And it's, it feels like it's trending towards not happening for Samir White. And well, I mean, he played in the second half of a preseason game. That's, that wasn't good. That That's was that good. It could be even worse than we think, but, or it could be like Dylan Lowby is involved season. Yeah, look, I, I, I just want to be clear. Like, I, I think that uh, folks can do better with that that pick, right? So Samir White's going 68th overall as RB23. It, I mean, it's not like you have to like break the bank to get Samir White. But in that range, you have Najee Harris, better pick. You have, uh, you know, Kyler Murray and Jordan Love, who, you know, I think are just better overall ways to build build your roster. Uh, uh, Evan Ingram, Chris, I know you hate Chris Godwin, but Chris Godwin. Um, you know, I just, there's just, in that range, I just don't, I'm not even seeing Samir Love. No, no. And it, again, it could be our loss. Because if we, if we miss out on a freebie RB2, it's a variable value, very valuable thing in fantasy, but yes, yeah. couldn't agree more. Like I'm on the clock. 
I, yeah, I just sees him here. Right next, just like scanning. I'm scrolling. Yeah, next, next, next. And I, I, of course, do this for 40 players because I don't think anyone's good. I think if you're if you're trying to finish, you know, like fourth in your fantasy league, you're hammering the mirror white. Oh, oh man, that's that's pretty mean. That's is that mean? Zamir, listen, I still we're still boys. I'm just I'm just saying. DeAndre Hopkins with his knee injury is now apparently expected back for week one. Uh, basically, do we still care about DeAndre Hopkins? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's got to be rostered, but how much does his presence really change? This one? I guess it changes a lot. He's still okay. Uh, so I mean, tell me tell me why we care. He's going to be scammy in, in a possibly, you know, pass-heavy Tennessee offense. I Very uh, extreme emphasis on possibly pass-heavy uh, offense. This That it's defense is going to stink, by the way. Yeah. I mean, from the evaluations that I've read, they're going to be quite bad. So well, Mike Brabel is the only thing holding that defense together to begin and with. And not and barely. Yeah, yes, true, barely. Yeah. Uh, so I, I I think they're going to be forced. I, I don't I you know, even if it's not the plan, I think it, it might actually be the plan to be passed first. But even if it's not the plan, I think they will be forced into those scripts. And that man, that could be so, so good for DeAndre Hopkins as a short area receiver. Um Am I excited to like roll him out in week one after this knee thing? Not really. I kind of have to see it probably. But I think, look, if you, if you if you draft like three or four really good receivers to start your draft, you can get Hopkins depending on your league. Um, I know, I know everyone listening to this said, not in my league. No, uh, but uh, you could get him as like your wide receiver five and just see how it goes. I, I think that's a luxury. That's a nice luxury. I mean, he's barely been going as a wide receiver four, more frequently been going as a wide receiver five, uh, having trouble cracking the top 100. So you're not exactly – he's like just inside the top 100, but there are drafts where he's falling outside the top 100. Right. Um, I will say, like, it wouldn't be my first choice with Will Levis, but every sign has suggested pass-heavy offense. From the coach mm-hmm. comments to the personnel acquisitions, like this just looks like a spread offense with – Tajay Spears, uh, Tony Pollard, the major investment in wide receiver, e- even including Tyler Boyd. Uh, it just looks like a spread, like modern attack to me. And it's kind of hard to believe that it's going to be under 30, like 32 pass attempts a game. I, I again, I don't know why really you do that necessarily with Will Levis, but it certainly seems like they're doing that. We'll take it. I mean, if for fantasy, I'm in, you know, it, it, it's, it's ugly, uh, but uh, my fantasy points don't care about ugly. Uh, they we'll, they we'll, do not care. We'll take it. I also I don't mind Calvin Ridley, honestly, where he's going just because of, of, of that volume. And I think the Titans, unlike the Jags, actually kind of know what to do with Ridley, <laughs> uh, which is uh, which will be good for, I think, his fantasy prospects. I am extremely concerned about Doug Peterson. He, d- he doesn't seem like he knows really what he's doing anymore. He, he, he seemed like someone who had one good yeah. idea. He yeah. was ahead of the curve in 2017, 2018. Yeah. And like everyone else caught up. And he's just like, I'm still doing my Doug thing. He seems to have lost his fastball. Uh, he's Belichickian in that way. Come on, man. I, I absolutely hate to lose my fastball after, you know, 417 career victories and 5,200 strikeouts and, you know, 110 <laughs> career shutouts. I really hate to lose my fastball. And, I mean, it happens to us all. It does happen. To, but don't compare Doug Peterson to Bill. I'm not saying they're the same. I'm just saying that it kind of feels that way with, like, Peterson having no new ideas the way the Belichick had. No new ideas for those final four years. Belichick, he 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 had a whiteboard that said "new ideas colon" <laughs> and then nothing written under it. <laughs> just nothing at all written under it. I just said "tight end?" Question mark. Right, right. new Bill, ideas. Do not sign another tight end. <laughs> new ideas. Oh sign two tight ends for a combined six hundred million dollars and don't use them at all. Don't ever use them. Um, Bill, please. Any uh, we meant any new idea other than that, uh, right? They, right. They he really did truly wanted to repeat that the, that glory year of uh, Hernandez and Gronk, and it didn't work out. He did. Never ever happened. Uh, speaking, one of the most lightning rod players the entire summer, Denny Tank Dell. He's been adding more fuel to the fire as the odd man out of Texans three receiver sets, but which we, we kind of expected that all along. Uh, the Texans, I think. The, the buzz is they're not using as many three receiver sets as we were kind of hoping. PFF Bobby fraud alert raging yet again. Um, 
I, I still though I have a hard time like reading too much. Like I don't think the Texans like unveiling the full scale of the yeah yeah the preseason. Um, yeah, so only ran six of eleven routes with the Texans starters, as you point mm-hmm. out. Uh, Nico Collins were at ten and nine respectively. Uh, what is the concern level with Tank Dell, who's being drafted as a wide receiver too? A lot of people need Tank Dell to be very very good. <laughs> it sounds like my co-host needs I think that'll be very no good. no i i unfortunately i had him on every team last year i'm literally putting him on like bust lists this year i'm out but could i i'm kind of scared i'm wrong for being out though i know i i don't i'm not scared of being wrong on him because the usage is pretty clear um look we, you do have to factor the digs personality situation into this like Stefan Diggs ain't going to ride the bench. Like that's not happening. Like he's literally going to leave the team if that happens. So uh, he's going to be on the field for as long as, you know, as long as he can handle it. And I think that may, that means that Tank Dell is going to be a 60, 65% route guy. He's still a big play threat. He's still going to be a beneficiary of probably a big season for CJ Stroud. So, yeah, some weeks it's going to look good, and some weeks it's going to, oh, yeah, of course, of course I'm playing Tank Dell. I don't care that he ran 60% of the routes. He caught three balls, one for a long touchdown. Um, but I think there will be dry spells. I think that when the Texans have game script on their side and they're running the ball a lot, you know, that's not that's not going to be great for a guy like Dell. Like, Diggs and Collins will still be able to get there, but it, it'll be Dell who just is not on the field enough often. So I worry about that. Saying that, saying that, you are one Nico Collins or Diggs injury away from Tank Dell being an instant top 12 receiver. You are. And he's a, he's a wide receiver, too, who should be going as a wide receiver three because he should be starting in every fantasy league. Um, his profile is just that of a boom bust wide receiver three, where if you're in the top 24, uh, there are occasionally boom bust guys there, but like he's got like a zero point floor. And he, he's just more, he, he's like a textbook wide receiver three to me. What do you want out of your wide receiver three? There's two archetypes. You either want like banked PPR points, like there's no upside, but you know there's a PPR floor. Or you want the matchup flipping upside where yeah. you might have one catch for 12 yards, but there are other weeks where he's three catches for 74 yards and two touchdowns. And that's what Tank Dell is to me still. That's what he was last year. And it's a, it's more of a wide receiver three profile to me. And he's going as a wide receiver two. And I mean, it makes sense. And and I don't think his ADP is, is crazy by any means. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to look real quick. Cause you know what? We can, we can actually talk facts and figures here. He's going uh wide receiver 29. So like Keenan Allen, Terry McLaurin range. I, I mean, I'm taking, I'm probably taking Dell over both those guys. Yeah. Maybe not Terry, depending on like my draft build. If like, again, where I just want to bank some points, maybe I'll take Terry. And if I need upside, I'll take Tank Dell. Yeah, I mean, and the next closest receiver is actually almost a full round ahead of Dell at with T. Higgins. So even though T. Higgins is the wide receiver 28 and Dell is the 29, there is actually a big gap there. Um, obviously, I would take Higgins over over Dell, but um, yeah, I, I don't think Dell's ADP is unreasonable. Not unreasonable. It would be unreasonable to not take a really quick break. We'll be right back after this. The Roto World Fantasy Football Draft Guide is now available exclusively through a partnership with Matthew Berry's Fantasy Life. Get a Fantasy Life Plus subscription and receive the Roto World Draft Guide plus fantasy, DFS, and betting tools to help you dominate all season long. Use promo code ROTO10 for 10% off. Go to fantasylife.com slash rotoworld to learn more. Uh, Denny, uh, we're talking about receivers and uncertain situations. Uh, the commanders are just like openly admitting, like, listen, listen, guys, we don't have a number two receiver. Uh, we do not. Uh, can you anyone have any ideas? Uh, do you have a number two receiver? You can maybe trade us. Not really sure it should be Diami Brown. Uh, Jahan Dotson is running in the slot, which, as you say, could be an interesting way to revive his career. But has the usage not been what it would need to be for Jahan Dotson if he was in the slot? Yeah, he uh, 80% slot rate. This past week against the Dolphins, uh, bef- the week before that, 50% slot rate. So, you know, they're trying. Like, they're trying to make dot- dots in a thing. Um, he has three catches uh, for 16 yards <laughs> in the preseason. I'm sorry. I shouldn't be laughing. Um, but, yeah, I mean, Dan Quinn is like, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're in the market for a wide receiver, too. And 
if you guys know anything, let me let me know. The GMs, uh, if you're listening. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, okay. The thing is, I was never interested in what in in Dotson. I'm not interested in anybody in this offense except for Terry McLaurin, sort of, and of course Jaden Daniels and Brian Robinson, and that's it. Um, I just don't think anybody else is going to see any sort of projectable volume. Like the wide receiver two for a hyper mobile quarterback who's going to be taking away dropbacks with his own rushing. It, the, the, the wide receiver two role is just is just so minuscule, you know. Uh, so Dot, Dotson should not be drafted unless your unless your uh, league is really deep. It's sad, but it's just we've seen it for years with the Ravens. We kind of saw even Gabe Davis couldn't get enough in Buffalo. Yeah, it's not a profitable spot, especially for a rookie. Like he's not going to be reinventing the wheel. Like Jaden is throwing to Terry McLaurin or the H back, or he's running. Um, he's like if he needs a lot, yeah. If he needs like the scam check down, it's going to the H back, Ben Sinnott or whatever. <laughs> Somehow a second round pick. Love to use a second round pick on an H back. But um, yeah, it's a, yeah, it was a curious choice. I digress. Uh, curious choice. Then need to let Malik Neighbors fall to more like the wide receiver twenty range when it seemed like maybe early in the off season he'd be like the wide receiver twelve range. Uh, so the ADP is high. What we will argue is it too low? Because uh, you've point you've pointed out a thirty three percent target share while playing essentially every snap this preseason. A deep A dot, um, like kind of like the Bears. Are we just not thinking big enough with a special young rookie in Malik Neighbors? We're not. It, it, not even close. Uh, wide receiver twenty four right now in PPR formats. Uh, I. I mean, look, I'm 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 actually thrilled about this, Pat, because it means that you I think you can get a major value. Look, man, it would be disastrous, I think, if neighbors finished as wide receiver 24 this year. It's yeah. not I mean, I, I, I truly I see a path easily to top 10 for neighbors. He's going to have a 30 ish percent target share. Do you know how hard it is? You are too big to fail. You when you have that sort of target share, I don't care. Well, the quality of targets and that you can't have it all. You can't have a 30% target share from Patrick Mahomes. You, you get it from Daniel Jones and, and you live with it. And, and, and neighbors has the kind of athletic profile where he can bust big plays off of short catches. And that's what the modern NFL is all about. I think he fits the modern NFL perfectly. I think he's going way too late. He's going after guys. I'm trying to find here. He's going after guys. Like, like I would take him over DJ Moore. Um, I, I would take him over Diggs, who's going way before him. Or take him over Diggs for sure. I'm not sure about DJ Moore. Uh, yeah, that's kind of. I, I would take him over Cooper Cup, who's going uh, due, due 14 picks ahead of him. I would too. Um, I go. I, Brandon Ayuk. I take him over Ayuk. I don't even know what team Ayuk's on anymore. I mean, he's so. not. Yeah, does he play? I don't. You know, yeah, does so he, does he still play football? Yes. Uh, right. You know, I, so I, I think you know, folks are saying, well, he's he's on the Giants, and the Giants are bad. I mean, yeah. Well, there's something to that, Denny, because all the shares in the world don't matter if the quarterback – and Daniel Jones in his good season, might I remind you, threw 15 touchdowns in 16 games. Yeah. Like that was the good – that was the season that got Daniel Jones paid. God, that's actually um, crazy. Wow. It is totally crazy. And I fall way more on your side of the argument, but I can't totally discount the other – like, yeah, wow, 32% target share. That's amazing. And it's 32% of 19 attempts per game. Oh, you like think they'll be super pass, run heavy? They're, they're going to be run heavy. They're going to be conservative. They're running out the clock on Daniel Jones's contract. I do think that, I mean, he's the one guy that we know is commanding targets. Uh, but I just do wonder, like, how much the target share can even amount to. And I, I'm on, Again, I'm on your side because he, he's the kind of player to get him the ball and, like, things are going to happen. But I, yeah. I, I I will say I think I think we get caught up with target share too much when we're talking about – super run heavy offenses. Like, you know, the whole talking point last year with Kyle Pitts is like, he had a 35% target share. And I was like, who cares, man? You, you, what, you, what you mean by that is six targets. That's what you mean by 35% target share. So if that's the case, then my neighbor's prognostication is going to be off the charts bad. Um, I I, I kind of think 30% would be, I, honestly, I mean, I, I think he has a chance to lead the league in targets. No, there's no way. There actually is no way. No. Someone in this offense <laughs> could not lead the league in targets. It just won't be possible with Daniel Jones. Like Daniel Jones, like 
he could play a hundred NFL seasons. Like it, like Daniel Jones, you're allowed to stay 26 forever. You get to play a hundred NFL seasons. At no point ever would he have a receiver capable of leading the league charges, <laughs> just because of the nature of his game. It did did you run? Did you run that simulation? I did. I did, and it just could not happen. It is not. Wow. Possible. 100, 100 Daniel Jones seasons, and they're all bad. They're all bad. <laughs> Every single one of them. Is bad. <laughs> Even the good ones are bad. That is what you had to remember, Dan. Even his good season was quite bad. Was really bad. Yes, it was. Again, bad. fifteen touchdowns to sixteen interceptions. No, no, no. Sorry, fifteen touchdowns in sixteen games. In sixteen so, games. Sorry. That very like that's like you know like Sid Luckett or whatever. Like yeah, Neil, right. Neil Jorgensen, um, like leading the league with stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, you mean Sonny Jurgensen? Yeah, Sonny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. So yeah, Sonny Jurgensen in a pre-war season, uh, leading the league with 15 touchdowns. Yeah. Yes. Jim Thorpe uh, led the entire decade of the 1920s with nine total touchdown passes. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Jones would have been amazing in the 1920s. <laughs> uh, we're just about out of time. Do you want to talk about Braylon Allen, or do you want to talk about Pat Fryermuth, or do you want to talk about Taysom Hill? Please do not. <laughs> I'm going to hit two of them. Braylon Allen still, I think, locked in as RB2. He's going to be a league winner if Reese Hall goes down. We're not hoping for it, but if it happens, Allen's in good position. And then Taysom Hill has crazy, crazy usage. We're talking back. Who cares? He always has crazy usage. Who cares? Backfield slot. He's getting he's getting goal line carries. He's lining up. Have one cool game and get hurt because he's our age. Oh, okay. That's what you're going to be coping so hard with Taysom this year. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the COVID- you know, one you know, 13 touches, and then no offense, like this is a bit bleak on Thursday. Like, oh, Taysom Hill's in the concussion protocol. I don't know <laughs> when it happened, but it happened. Oh, he's saying because he's okay, okay. When he was handling 13, a career high 13 touches on Sunday, he got injured. Yeah, yeah. okay. I mean, that, I guess that could happen, but I mean, your, your coping and crying is going to be really <laughs> epic. On well, what's going to be any different this time? I really uh, don't know. So, okay, all I'll say is on Taysom, if he's tight end eligible in your league, but don't whine, be. don't whine about it. Don't whine. You draft him. You draft him late, and he's going to be. I'm telling you, right? I'm telling you right now, he's going to be a tight end one for two weeks total. No, for the season for two, two total weeks, and like it'll be like high profile weeks, so like a game in like the 4:30 Eastern window on Fox, like right before Thanksgiving, or like a Monday Night Football game. And yeah, but then oh yeah, he injured his calf. Uh, he's got a I, broken pinky. I just want to reiterate the first thing Clint Kubiak did when he got this job as offensive coordinator in New Orleans is set up a meeting with Taysom Hill. That's a fact. God, okay. That's, that's a fact. They, they met multiple times. Okay. I don't care age, whatever. He's not fast. It does. It just doesn't matter to me. I like fantasy points. If you're going late round tight end, if you're fading all the great tight ends and that's fine, whatever Taysom Hill's your guy. That's it. Will we ever be rid of this guy? No. Man. <laughs> never ever will uh we are unfortunately rid of this show we had some stuff we wanted to get to we just ran out of time way too much going on right now including our roto world draft day marathon check that out on thursday august 22nd all day long denny and i doing a q a at noon eastern denny doing another q a at i believe 7 30 eastern denny 7 30 yep mm-hmm. roto world football show live at 2 p.m eastern a special guest andy barons uh, mock draft sprinkled throughout the day it's just gonna be a hell of a day at Roto World. Uh, so for Denny, I'm Pat. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back all day Thursday.